Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Hopefully everyone is doing well. Today, we will continue our PHC for 73 lectures. We will cover the insulin and glucose lowering agents. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to describe the pathophysiology of diabetes mellitus and describe the goal of therapy. Besides that, you need to identify the type of insulin preparation and describe the pharmacological effects and classify the glucose lowering drugs and their mechanism of action and as well as the pharmacological effects. The diabetic mellitus can be classified into four types here. Let's see the picture here first. For the normal person, usually the pancreas will be able to separate appropriate amount of insulin. Once insulin binds to the receptor on the liver, it will inhibit the production of glucose. While when it binds to the receptor of the muscle cell and adipose tissue, it will promote the glucose uptake by the respective organs. For type 1 diabetes, the disease caused by the pancreas unable to produce the insulin due destruction of beta cell in pancreatic islet. The insulin deficiency will cause no glucose uptake by the muscle cell and adipose tissue and also may cause liver to continue producing glucose which lead to high glucose level in, this blood, in the blood. This disease usually managed to detect during childhood years. There are two main factors for the type 2 diabetes which are the beta cell to produce less insulin or insulin resistant. This insulin resistance may happen on the skeletal muscle and adipose tissues as well as in the liver cells. This will induce the hyperglycemia. All the patients, especially obesity, have high tendency to develop the type 2 diabetes mellitus. Latent autoimmune diabetes in adults is a form of type 1 diabetes that develops later into adulthood. LADA tends to develop more slowly than type 1 diabetes in childhood. LADA can sometimes appear similar to type 2 diabetes that doctor may mistakenly diagnose the LADA as type 2 diabetes. MODI or maturity onset diabetes of the young is a rare case that refers to any of several hereditary forms of diabetes mellitus caused by mutation in an autosomal dominant gene disrupting insulin production. The pancreatomy is the surgical removal of all or part of the pancreas. GDM refers to the diabetes that occur on pregnant women. Uncontrolled diabetes is very scary. It can cause major complications on the microvascular and macrovascular as stated here. We can measure the effectiveness of the pharmacological treatment for diabetic patients based on their glycemic or in other words their blood glucose control level. The glycemic target should be individualized to minimize risk of hypoglycemia, means that sudden loss of sugar in the blood. These tables show five measurement aspects for diabetic patients. The blood glucose level can be measured through preprandial, postprandial, or HbA1c. Preprandial means before meal. You might have heard the words in context of preprandial plasma glucose. This refers to your blood sugar level before a meal, must be between 4.4 to 7.0 millimol per liter. The word postprandial means after a meal. Therefore, postprandial plasma glucose concentrations refer to plasma glucose concentration after post 2 hour eating, which in the range of 4.4 up to 8.5 millimol per liter. More than that, it's considered diabetes. HbA1c should, not, should be not more than 6.5%. Besides the glycemic control, lipids, blood pressure, body weight, also equally important to reduce the risk of any cardiovascular diseases. Hemoglobin A1c, also referred as HbA1c, is a form of hemoglobin, which is a blood pigment that carries oxygen, that is bound to glucose. 
HbA1c also is known as glycosylated or glycated hemoglobin. This HbA1c can be last in our body up to 3 months. Miss that. The HbA1c test is an indicator to show the average level of blood sugar over the past 2 to 3 months. Healthy HbA1c levels are less than 5.3 and the diabetic patients has more than 6.5% of it. Why HbA1c measurement is, is, is important? It is because every 1% in reduction in HbA1c may reduce risk by 21%. Any diabetes related to death can reduce 40% of myocardial infarction, 37% of microvascular complication, and Every 1% reduction in HbA1c may reduce 43% amputations. The preprandial and postprandial blood glucose level can be self-monitoring. These self-monitoring blood glucose are crucial for those receive the insulin therapy. The checkup must be done minimum twice daily or before any injection of insulin. If this patient tend to develop hypoglycemia or not achieve the A1C target, they are required to monitor the postprandial blood glucose and sometime in the middle of night. The pharmacological treatment between type 1 and type 2 diabetes are slightly different. Insulin therapy, the only pharmacological treatment that works for type 1 diabetes, whereas oral anti-diabetic drug are the first line therapy for newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes with no comorbidities such as hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity. An insulin injection may be introduced when the HbA1c are not achieved the target. This is the indication of insulin therapy. They are absolutely for type 1 diabetes mellitus, GTM, and for those who experience the ketoacidosis and relatively it will be initial therapy in newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes with A1C more than 10% or fasting plasma glucose more than 30 mmol per liter or inadequate glycemic control on optimal dose and number of oral anti-diabetics drugs. Before we discuss further about insulin therapy, Let's recap back the production of natural insulin in our body and their mechanism of action. The endogenous production of insulin in beta cells is triggered by few factors such as rising blood glucose levels, the presence of amino acid, fatty acid and ketone body also able to stimulate the insulin release. Alpha-2 adrenergic stimulation inhibit the release of insulin, whereas the beta adrenergic stimulation promotes the insulin release. High level of glucagon promote the release of the insulin, but somatostatin inhibit the release of cells. Another hormone, which is GIP and GLP, stimulate the insulin. This video will explain what is the GIP and GLP. Please take, please take note about this because it relates to anti-diabetic drugs that are able to mimic this hormone. Let's first take a look at how the incretin system helps control postprandial blood glucose levels. After we consume food, increased luminal levels of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins rapidly induce the release of various peptide hormones and signaling factors into the bloodstream from the enteroendocrine cells in the gut. Two of these hormones, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, or GIP, and glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, have been shown to stimulate insulin release from the pancreas. GIP is released from K cells, which are predominantly located in the proximal small intestine, whereas GLP-1 is produced by L cells, which are primarily found in the distal small intestine and colon. GIP and GLP-1 travel through the bloodstream to the pancreas. 
In the presence of glucose, these hormones bind to G-protein coupled receptors on beta cells, resulting in enhanced insulin biosynthesis and secretion. In healthy individuals, incretin hormones appear to be responsible for between 50 and 70 percent of the insulin release after a meal, although this point is still a matter of some debate. Higher insulin levels promote glucose uptake by the liver, skeletal muscle, and fat tissue, thereby lowering the concentration of circulating glucose. So from this video, the GIP, which is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, and GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, are produced in the presence of the glucose. This hormone will bind to the G-couple receptors in the beta cell of pancreas which activate the CAMP to induce the secretion of insulin from storage granule. Besides that, GAP1 also able to cross the blood brain barrier and decrease the appetite. This is the clear picture of the secretion of insulin by the presence of glucose. The glucose will be influxed through glucose core transported to in the beta cell of the pancreas. The glucose uptake will rise the ATP level through glycolytic phosphorylations. This ATP will inactivate the potassium channel, which causes depolarization of the membranes. This situation leads to opening of the calcium channel, allowing influx of calcium ions. This leads to release of the insulin from their storage granule. Besides that, as you can see in this picture, the presence of incretin, which are GLP-1 and GIP, will activate the CAMP, which promotes the release of insulin. Insulin binds to alpha subunit of its receptor, which causes phosphorylation of the beta subunit which in turn induces the tyrosine kinase activity. This tyrosine kinase activity begins a cascade of a cell phosphorylation such as MMP kinase as well as PI3K pathway. This PI3K activation causes translocation of GLUT4 containing vesicle to the surface promoting glucose influx to induce the glycolysis. Can you recap back what is the glycolysis in your biochemistry course? The glycolysis is the process of breaking down glucose or other words as sugar metabolism in the body. It contributes to the production of energy which is ATP. The PITK pathway also promoting the glycogen synthesis which is glycogenesis via activation of glycogen synthase promoting the protein synthesis and lipogenesis while inhibiting the lipolysis. Besides that, the PI3K pathway also promotes the cell survival and proliferation. Insulin therapy in Malaysia are fully derived by recombinant technology or genetically modified human insulin. The type of insulin according to their pharmacokinetic profile, which are prandial insulin, basal insulin and premixed insulin. Prandial insulin being administered pre-meal or before the meal because of its short or rapid onset of action in controlling the postprandial glucose execution. Basal insulin has intermediate to long acting of insulin action. That's why it usually administered at bedtime. The basal insulin only cover the basal insulin requirement in our body. And the last one, premixed insulin, is the biphasic insulin that incorporates both the short or rapid acting insulin with intermediate insulin into a single preparation to cover both to cover for both postprandial glucose execution as well as basal insulin needs. This is the prandial insulin that available in the markets. As you can see here, the rapid acting has 50 minute onset of action and short acting insulin required 30 minutes to onset the insulin actions. 
That's why we will counsel the patient to have a shoot of insulin 30 minutes for act rapid or 5 to 50 minutes for rapid active insulin prior each meal. The most common prandial insulin that available in government hospital is Actrapid or Humulin R. The basal insulin can be intermediate acting insulin, which is NPH or neutral protamine hagodon, and long acting insulin. Insulatide and humulin N are the basal insulin used in our country. We will advise these patients to take this insulin at their bedtime. The duration of the intermediate insulin can be up to 16 to 24 hours. For the premix insulin, is the combination of the rapid or short acting insulin that mix with intermediate active insulin. This combination works well by helps the body controls blood sugar all through the day as well as help the body control the blood sugar at specific meal times. This insulin should be given subcutaneously approximately 30 to 45 minutes before a meal. The most common premix insulin that been practiced here in Malaysia is Mixtat and Humulin 3070. So, how the insulin differs between one and another? As you can see here, this is the insulin structure of the mixed type. All the insulin are administered through subcutaneous. The mixed type consists of 30% of insulin aspart, which is orange color, and 70% of NPH, which is blue color. As you can see here, the zinc ion will coordinate sick insulin monomer, sick insulin monomer, to form the hexameric structure on which maturated insulin crystals are based. The insulin hexamer has minimal division. That's why they need to dissociate into monomer to promote rapidly diffuse into the blood capillary. The insulin aspart exists as hexamer are rapidly dissociated into the monomer lead to rapidly absorbed to the bloodstream. In contrast, NPH exists as a multi hexamer that causes slow dissociation to the monomer. That's why intermediate and long acting insulin cover the best cover the basal insulin requirements in our body. So, this is the guideline for insulin therapy for type 2 diabetes mellitus. This part will cover on next week on clinical overview of diabetes mellitus. Let's have a breakfast before we continue our second part of the lecture which is glucose lowering agents.